Afternoon all. Lofar Smith died recently on May 18th, 2013. He was a very strong grandmaster, born May 29th in Radebeul, Germany. Uh, he was awarded the IM title in 1951, the GM and also the GMC titles in 1959. So that enabled him to be, for example, a referee of major world championship matches. He was also the German Correspondence Champion in 1952 and came second with Lucius Endvins behind Ragozin in the second Correspondence Chess Championship of 1956 to 62. He owns also the finest private chess library in the world and was a fair-minded popular judge as was witnessed in the Fischer Spassky World Championship match of 1972, the Karpov Korshnoi World Championship match of 1978 and the Karpov Kasparov World Championship rematch of 1986 and even Fischer's rematch against Spassky much later. He was still an arbiter then. Let's have a look at one of his games from the Bamberg tournament of 1968. He was playing white against Heike Westenin, another grandmaster. He played c4. Heike Westenin played e5. Knight c3. Knight f6. After knight f3 now we see d6. So that's kind of old Indian territory now. After d4, black took the plunge and pushed forward with e4, setting up a potential liability. This e4 pawn could potentially be vulnerable. It's immediately attacked, it's supported, and now a creative move to undermine e4 is played here. Ofar played g4. Also accelerating, a fianchetto bishop to put more pressure on this diagonal, which could be dangerous for black. Black takes with the bishop, and we see bishop g2, so a temporary gambit. But he's going to get the pawn back. Knight c6. Knight g takes e4. Now black took on e4. Knight takes e4. And now it looks a little bit dangerous on this diagonal. And potentially queen a4 could also be useful for d5. Perhaps black, a bit concerned here, plays queen d7. Now this bishop on g4 is kicked with h3. It moves to f5. Now knight g3, and it's uncomfortable for the bishop. If bishop e6, then d5, it goes actually to g6. But now, although the pawn's already moved, moving it again is not too bad here. Because now bishop h3 is introduced along this diagonal, stopping black. Um, well, it's not appealing to castle queenside and face bishop h3, even though f5 might be playable here. Black plays the move h6 here. And we see queen b3, so immediately threatening b7. And offering d4, what can black actually do here? Well, you might think, well, hold on. What about if black just protected the pawn? Let's have a brief look. Then d5 is actually annoying. For example, knight e5, bishop e3. And we have numerous threats like bishop h3 and bishop a7, which black has to contest with. And it's not very pleasant. So really, after queen b3, Black thought it best to take on d4. And now we see queen e3 check. The knight has to go back. And now a very dangerous forcing move indeed. Instead of just taking on b8, that will be I think, harmless, relatively harmless. Uh, we see f4. And the idea is now revealed after f5 that actually bishop takes b7 is a great deal more effective than before. So f4 is in effect made made uh, this idea much more effective just to take on b7 now. And after rook d8, I wonder if you can spot why. Why is bishop takes b7 so effective? What is it introduced here after f4? If I give you 10 seconds now, what would you play, play here with white? So 10 seconds starting from now. Okay. Lofar plays bishop c6 and he's winning material. Black actually resigns here. If we take note that this knight's actually protecting the rook, so that isn't a threat. So we just take on e6. 
check and then we can just take on g6 check winning a whole piece so black had to resign here it was a very neat forceful game i thought and we might have a look this week at some other notable games of lofar so a great uh, chess player in both over the board chess and correspondence chess and in the world of arbiting and you know it takes a lot to please Fisher for fairness of matches so he was an arbiter that was able to please Fisher in 1972 as well he will be missed greatly comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much